So today we will be discussing uh, how value is created and what role does beta play in determination of value. Unfortunately, in academics, the way uh, we have learned and applied beta is not the same as beta is used by practitioners in the industry. So first, I uh, will try to explain uh, in brief uh, how uh, the beta is uh, calculated and used and then I will uh, briefly touch upon the limitations of the beta and then I will touch upon uh, how industry practitioners used beta. Uh, which typically is called as the, the Hamada equation or the asset beta and how do you arrive at the value of a company using the concept of asset betas. Now, I uh, will I'll draw your attention to the, to the slide here on how value is created. Now, value is created as you can see using three functions that a finance manager does. The first function is the investment decision. Now, investment decision uh, relates to where the investments uh, needs to go, how the investments needs to be allocated between fixed assets and working capital and uh, this decision actually helps you to determine what is called as the net cash flow from operations. The second way in which the finance manager creates value for the shareholder is by uh, taking operating decisions. Operating decisions are essentially uh, what, we, what we learn in finance as uh, the, the price versus uh, the va volume, uh, uh, in, in what product mix does uh, the, a, a, a finance manager needs to produce to, to maximize the cash flows and things like that. The third method or th the third uh, uh, way in which the uh, finance manager maximizes value for a shareholder is what is called as a financing decision. Now, financing decision is a, a ratio or a, a mix that a finance manager has to decide in which he has to raise a depth versus the equity, uh, what we typically call as a depth equity ratio. Now, this way of raising or funding the business also plays a very critical role because this essentially decides the discount rate. So, so we all we all learn about the capital structure theories and through capital structure theories how we determine the, the expectations of the shareholder and the bond holder and the sum of the, the expectations of the shareholder and the bond holder leads us to what is called as a overall uh, discount rate or overall uh, cost of capital. Now, the finance manager uh, uh, plays a critical role because he is the, the, the person who, who is responsible for uh, deciding or determining the cash flow and he is the person who is also responsible for determining the discount rate. And these two put together will uh, lead to the determination of enterprise value and from the enterprise value through some corporate adjustments we lead to what is called as the equity value. Now, I uh, will come to uh, the, the accounting balance sheet and the financial balance sheet. Now, the accounting balance sheet we all know has got current assets, fixed assets on the asset side and on the, on the, on the liability side it has got current liabilities, long term liabilities and shareholder fund. Now, the accounting balance sheet is typically on its historical value and though we have adopted the NDS, the new NDS where we are supposed to uh, calculate a uh, couple of uh, uh, assets and the, uh, the value of couple of liabilities on its present value basis. But uh, as you already know that in India still large part of the fixed assets are already on the historical values and not on their uh, uh, current values. But at the same time there are couple of investments of marketable securities which are traded on its uh, fair value and the present value. Uh, we also have the problem that most of the liabilities on the books of the financial accounting uh, are typically on their historical value and now this creates a distortion because when we have to calculate the value of the company, what differentiates the accounting balance sheet and the financial balance sheet is as you can see that the financial balance sheet typically works with the present value of investment, the, the present value of loans and the expected value of the future investments and the sum of, sum of the three leads to what is called as a shareholder value. Now, as you can see that most or three components in the financial balance sheet has got the word present value over there and the present value means that you have to discount something and in order to discount something we need to have a discount rate and since we are talking of the discounting rate we have to rely on what is called, typically called as a CAPM model where we have to use the beta. 
Now let us take a step back and look at how beta is calculated and the limitations of beta. So beta as you can see the equation is the covariance of the stock and the market divided by the variance of the market. Now the, the, the procedure is very simple, you download daily data of the index, you download daily data of the stock for which you want to calculate beta, you calculate the percentage change of index, you calculate the percentage change of uh, the stock, you, you call uh, the percentage change of index as series x you, and you obtain uh, the series y and you run a regression of the x and the y and what you see on the, on the regression equation as a slope is essentially the beta. Now when we calculate the beta in this manner, the first problem area that we all encounter is that this beta has to be calculated for what length of time. So should we use beta of 1 year, should we use beta of 5 year or should we go back to the day when the, the company started trading and there is no concrete answer to this. Secondly, we encounter this problem that the value of the stock and the index that we take should it be on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, yearly basis and there is unfortunately again no answer to what is right and what is wrong. Now the problem in, in this is that when you take a shorter period like let us say you calculate a beta for one year period which I would consider as a shorter period, you may have a value which will be quite different from the value if you obtain the beta using a 30 year period. Now again the person who is using the CAPM model does not have a, the theory does not have an answer as to what is the optimum way of looking at it. There is also one more problem with the, with this way of calculating beta and that is that sometimes we may have a negative beta. Now negative beta though practically it is not possible but typically if you are working with some dummy numbers you may end up with a negative beta or if you are looking at a very short period of time and where the, the securities have moved uh, in the opposite direction of how the index has moved you may end up with a negative beta. Now unfortunately CAPM does not work with a negative beta because it requires a positive number for the, for the method to throw you, to throw, to give you an answer. Now, Beta is just a measure of systematic risk. So beta does not capture the unsystematic risk. So this again has a limitation because when you are trying to determine the discount rate, you have to consider the systematic risk as well as the unsystematic risk. Beta also has one more problem and this is I would say the biggest problem of beta that you cannot arrive at a discount rate and a beta for a company which has not yet traded. So the question is how do you arrive at a discount rate for a company which has, which, has, which has just started trading because there is no trading history. So on what basis will you calculate beta? So, so there is no way of calculating a beta for a startup company. Now uh, you may have heard that the beta has to be influenced uh, by the depth equity ratio of the company. So, so what I am essentially trying to say is that a company with a high depth equity ratio should have a higher beta because it has a higher risk as compared to a company which has got maybe no depth uh, and it is a pure equity funding company and typically it should have a lower beta. So uh, we, we are now introducing two new words levered beta and unlevered beta. So typically when we obtain a beta of uh, let us say a company called as uh, Nestle India and uh, Nestle India let us assume that it has got some amount of depth on its balance sheet and when we obtain a beta uh, from, from, the, from the market values on, uh, at which it is trading, the, the, the beta value that we get is called as actually the levered beta because the company had depths on its books. So now uh, if we have to apply a similar, uh, if you have to value a similar company which is into similar kind of a product line and uh, that company has got no trading history, there is only one way out of valuing it and the, and the method is that we have to take the beta of Nestle and apply it to the beta of the new company in order to value it. Now again we are stuck with one problem because 
this new company's capital structure may be quite different than the capital structure of Nestle. And if we are using the levered beta of Nestle, then what we are essentially doing is misleading. There are also some issues with regards to the raw beta and the adjusted beta. Now, I will try to explain what it is. Now, it has the literature, uh, financial literature has proved that beta in the long run tends to move closer to 1. And so, a couple of financial databases like uh, Thomson and Bloomberg have also introduced a concept of raw beta and adjusted beta. And here what they do is, uh, the raw beta is the beta that you would have generally obtained by regressing the two uh, x and y of the index in the stock. And the adjusted beta is, they multiply a certain portion of the beta with 1 and then they add it up. So, raw beta into uh, let us say 0 0.66 plus 1 into 0 0.33 will give you what is called as an adjusted beta. And the whole idea of doing it is that the adjusted beta has to be has to be closer to 1. So, this is a way how they uh, get the adjusted beta. Now, on this slide you will you will see uh, how unlevering of beta has to be done. So, unlevered beta is a beta of a company which has got no depth uh, on its books and levered beta is a beta of a company which has got depths on its books. So, this way of levering and unlevering beta or this equation is also popularly known as the Hamada equation. Uh, and as you can see that the levered beta is unlevered beta into 1 plus 1 minus tax rate into the depth by equity. Now, what, what this typically does is that it gives the depth equity ratio of a company a weightage in calculating the levered beta. Now, uh, we will discuss about unlevered beta. So, this can be calculated by obtaining beta of comparable firms within the same industry, unlevered beta of all companies and then obtain the median values or weighted average value and this can be used as an asset beta. Now, I will explain how this is done. So, uh, let us say we want to value a startup and for valuing the startup, we want to have a asset beta. Now, this, this process tells you how to obtain the asset beta. Now, the first step that you have to take is that whichever company you are trying to value it, you, you have to first try and determine the industry from which it belongs. Now, let us pick up some company which has recently started uh, uh, developing some auto parts. And so, the first step will be to find out those companies which are into uh, auto parts and uh, we have to obtain the, uh, the beta of the company from its existing market price versus the index values. Now, this is quite simple because the way we have been doing it, we have to just follow those steps to calculate beta. Now, once we obtain the beta of all those peer comparable companies, what we have to do is we have to find or we have to unlever them and the logic is that when we unlever them, what we will obtain is called as a asset beta. Now, when we unlever them, what we will essentially do is we will use the Hamada equation, we will use their respective uh, depth equity ratios and by using the Hamada equation, we will obtain the unlevered betas. Now, when we have the unlevered betas, of let us say whatever uh, uh, your competing companies are, those betas will be called as the industry betas or asset betas and, and what we can do is we can use this asset beta as a proxy for valuing the new startup company which does not have a beta because it does not have any trading history. So, now when we apply uh, the concept of uh, asset beta to value new startups, we take care of many problems that were existing in the, the original case where we were using beta in its raw form. Point number one, there will not be any issue like negative beta because assets beta will never come out to be negative. This method can also be applied to companies with no trading history. Beta increases with increase in financial leverage and this can be handled very easily. So, when we work with asset beta and when we have asset beta of uh, the industry, we can apply this asset beta to any new company and since we know that leverage plays a role and the company which is levered should have a 
uh, levered beta which can be higher or lower depending on what kind of uh, leverage it is working with. So, we can e very easily handle the, the beta and the leverage of the company. So, we can take care of the systematic risk which is measured by the asset beta typically or the industry the average of the industry beta and we can also take care of the unsystematic risk which is the risk of the, the debt equity ratio of the company. Now, this also serves as a very big uh, tool the use of asset beta and how it helps is let us assume for a minute that a company needs to be valued by 10 different people. Now, if 10 different people are left free to use the own discount rate without any logic, we may end up we may end up with 10 different values and we do not know what is right and what is wrong. But when we ask people to value a company using a concept of asset beta, then the problem is automatically solved because the asset beta will be only one and all the 10 analysts who are trying to value the company have to use only one beta and since they, they their starting point is same, the leverage of the company is well known, all the 10 people will have only one beta and one answer to the CAPM model. So, this way of uh, practicing the concept of beta is actually uh, very popular in uh, industry and this is the only way we do it. Now, I will try and explain to you by taking an example and uh, we will learn how to, how to lever and unlever and how to calculate the asset beta. So, I have uh, taken uh, the, the auto ancillary uh, stocks. I have taken stocks like uh, Excite Industry, I have taken Amara Raja, I have taken uh, JTKT uh, which was earlier known as Sonakoya, I have taken uh, Sundaram Clayton and I have taken Madarsan Sumi. Now, on the slide as you can see the, the first column is the beta and as you can see this, this beta of Excite Industry is 0.86, Amara Raja is 0.46 and these betas that you see are obtained using their uh, fi 5 year uh, monthly data and these all are actually your uh, levered betas. Now, we have assumed that the tax rate which applies to all the Indian stock is 35 percent. So, in the second column you can see 35 percent mentioned there. Now, we, we have to uh, unlever them and so we have to obtain what is called as a net depth. The formula for net depth is uh, the long term depth minus the cash because cash is uh, a value on the balance sheet which can always be used to pay the depth. And so, we will use the concept of net debt to move forward. So, we have obtained the value of cash and the value of debt sitting on their balance sheet as on March 2018 and we obtained the value called as net debt. Now, as you can see that net debt values for companies differ. For excise industry, it is minus 12542 and for a company like Sundaram Clayton, it is plus 24692. What these two numbers essentially mean is Excite industry has got a surplus of cash over the debt and a company like Sundaram Clayton has got excess of debt over the cash. Now, uh, all this data was obtained on 17th of October 2018 and uh, we obtained the market uh, capitalization or the, the equity value and as you can see Excite industry has a market capitalization of 224000. Uh, and these numbers are in millions. Now, using the net depth and using the market capitalization, we obtain the depth equity ratio and as you can see there, Excite industry has a depth equity ratio of uh, practically 0, Amara Raja has 0, JTKT has 4 percent, Sundaram Clayton is 33 percent and Madarsan Sumi is at 9 percent. Now, if you observe for Excite industry, the beta is 0.86 and the asset beta is also 0.86 and this is simply because it does not have any depth. So, when you apply the Hamada equation of leveraging and unleveraging, you actually uh, have nothing because it does not have any depth. So, for a company like Excide, the, the, the beta that you obtain from the market is will or will be used as a proxy of asset beta calculation. Now, let us talk of a company uh, Sundaram Clayton. Now, Sundaram Clayton beta was 0.97 and when you unlever this beta, the asset beta works out to 0.8, which is lower than the uh, normal beta that you obtained. Now, this is because that this company had a depth equity of 33 percent and as we discussed earlier, the asset beta of 0.8 has to be lower than the levered beta of 0.97, which you obtained by using the 5 year monthly data. Now, 
Now what we will essentially do is, now we have got the asset betas of all the 5 companies used in our example uh, for auto ancillary stocks. Now we will find the average of all the 5 stocks and as you can see that the average of all 5 stock is 1.03. Now this 1.03 will be used as the asset beta for calculating the value of any stock which has recently come up in the market and has got no trading history. Now when you use 1.03 as an asset beta for auto ancillary industry, the, the advantage is that people in your business will have to use this asset beta only and then apply it on the company whoever you are trying to value it. Now, as we discussed earlier, uh, when everybody works with the same beta, there are no chances that you will get different different discount rates. And since you already know that the value of stock is most sensitive to the discount rate, this way of manipulating the, the stock price uh, by analyst can be easily rectified because there will be no scope of changing the discount rates and hence changing the value of the shareholder.